So, good afternoon everyone, my name is Ted, um, I'm from the Higher Education Statistics Agency, so if you don't know a lot about us, we essentially collect data from all providers across the UK and then disseminate outputs from that uh, on a regular basis. But for today I'll be presenting on the graduate wage premium, and so in terms of the structure of the presentation, I'll talk to you a bit about why this topic remains of importance in the public domain, I'll then go through some of the previous literature and I'll talk about how the LFS has been used. I'll then outline our contribution to this area. That'll be followed by the methodology, results and robustness checks we did, and I'll offer some concluding thoughts on the findings. So, over the last 25 years, there's been great divergence in the way higher education is funded across the UK nations. So, in England, it's now above £9,000 for tuition fees, but in Scotland, you have free tuition fees. But higher education will always come with a significant cost in the sense that you're going to forego three to four years of labour market earnings. And one of the key trends that has emerged, regardless of the nation you look at, is that students are leaving their education with growing student loan balances. And so that's led to ongoing questions about the value of higher education. So it's a topic that remains of importance to the media, policymakers, prospective students and their families. So, much of the research that's been carried out in this area by academics over the last two decades has utilised the Labour Force Survey. And the key reason for that is that it's been a regular collection on a quarterly basis since the early 1990s, and the questions on hourly pay and qualifications have remained broadly consistent over that time. Now, most of these studies have essentially gone up to birth cohorts born prior to 1990 and up to around the mid-2010s, and the general consensus within the literature is that there's been broad stability in the graduate premium over the 1990s and 2000s. And that's nicely illustrated by this graph in one of the most recent papers to utilise the LFS, which is by Blundell and colleagues at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. You essentially have a number of lines overlapping one another, indicating that stability in the premium. But perhaps we should also ask ourselves about the theory since the late 1980s, we've seen a really rapid expansion in higher education participation. So if you were to look at ONS data, in 1992, 17% of the workforce were graduates. By 2013, that had risen to 38%. And if you think about supply and demand analysis, whenever you see a huge increase in supply, you'd expect to fall in the price, here being the graduate wage premium. So there's this essentially misalignment between the theory and the empirical evidence. And so early explanations as to why we were seeing this centred around the rise of the microcomputer in the late 1980s. Economists were essentially arguing that this new technology required a high level of skill and this increased the demand for graduates in such a way that it offset the increase in supply. Now, not everyone was won over by this explanation. People were saying, well, how can you be so sure that the increase in demand was exactly enough to offset the increase in supply? And actually, Blundell and colleagues in their paper have suggested an alternative model. So if we just summarise their model, essentially, think of the UK economy as uh, one in which there are two types of firms. One firm will operate under a centralised structure where hierarchy dictate the tasks to workers. And in the other, there's a decentralised approach where you essentially have more autonomy over your tasks. Now, when you're in a low-skill economy, it's more profitable for the firms to operate under a centralised approach. But as the skill level starts to grow in the economy, firms find it profitable to switch over to the decentralised approach. And they essentially argue that this is what was happening in the UK economy in the 1990s and 2000s. But what that will mean is that there's a period where there's two types of firms in the economy. There's both centralised and decentralised. And if you were to look at their paper, they put forward a number of mathematical derivations to show that during that transition phase, there'll be no change in the relative wage premium. And so they argue that's what's caused that stability. And what they suggest towards the end of the paper is that actually the transition ended towards the first half of the 2010s. And this is where our research really comes in, because what we ask ourselves is, well, given what they're suggesting, do more recent data sets point to the fact that the premium is now starting to fall? So we're going to contribute to literature by, yes, using more recent data sets, but also an alternative approach. So instead of utilising the LFS as our main data source, we're going to use that as a complementary data set. We actually rely upon the cohort studies that are collected in the UK. Uh, I'll come back to uh, a bit more about these data sets shortly, but 
One of these follows those born in 1970. They were surveyed at the age of 26 in 1996, and data is collected on their earnings and qualifications at that time. And then in a follow-up study, in the next step sample follows those born around 1989 and 1990, so a two-decade period between these two cohorts. And they were surveyed again around the age of 26, just after 2015. And obviously this was a period of really rapid expansion in HE participation. <coughs> We'll then use the LFS to basically see, well, do, they, do these different sources lead to the same conclusions? And use the LFS to also look at the timings of those changes. So I spoke earlier about the benefits of the LFS. And so it's quite important to also recognise its limitations. If you're looking to understand the true impact of education on earnings, you have to factor in that there will be other basically other factors at play that might be driving the relationship. So the most common example used in the literature is ability. If you're a high ability student, you're more likely to stay in education for longer, but also likely to earn more in the labour market. If we just look at the raw relationship between education and earnings and don't factor in for ability, some of what we're capturing in education might actually be driven by their ability. So we need to try and control for these factors. We can't do that with the LFS because such factors aren't available. So there's a potential for you to essentially inaccurately estimate the, the premium. Some of you will be aware now that the uh, longitudinal education outcomes data sets available, which links together tax, benefits and education records. But this too has its own limitations. It essentially covers those born from the mid-1980s onwards. And so there's a limited period in which you can go back to look at this issue. But more importantly, the data is only available on annual earnings. Now that can be particularly problematic if you're trying to estimate the premium for females. The evidence suggests that non-graduate females are more likely to work part-time than graduate females. So without the hours worked information, any estimate you do find could be driven by hours worked. Now the cohort studies which are collected on a regular basis in the UK are very rich in the information they collect. So cognitive assessments are normally taken with the cohort member at a young age. Parents are interviewed at the early stages of the person's life. And so you have very rich detail on their cognitive ability their, and their non-cognitive ability and also their family background. So what we'll do is we'll just run the standard regression approach. We'll begin by including education only and then we'll successively introduce various controls and see how that affects the estimated premium. And we do this in both the British cohort study and next steps, and we try to ensure the controls remain as similar as possible. So just some key definitions. Uh, the pay here, we're talking about uh, the graduate premium as the extent to which the pay of graduates exceeds that of non-graduates in percentage terms. We exclude postgraduates on the basis that they'll just enter the labour market at age 25, 26. And I'll come back to the issue of net and gross pay later on. So these are our key findings. Prior to including any controls, we see that in the British cohort study, the estimated premium is 22% and 14% in next steps, so a decline of 8 percentage points. But you can see the importance of including certain types of controls, such as household background and cognitive ability in next steps, as that reduces the estimated premium. Once we include our full set of controls, the estimated premium in the BCS is 18% and only 8% in next steps. So our key takeaway message from the analysis of the cohort studies is there's been a decline over this two decade period, 10 percentage points. Actually, we find that decline to be common amongst both men and women. Now, when you're estimating the premium, you are going to encounter a various number of challenges. One of these is around selection into employment. And what we mean by this is that around the late uh, 20s, early 30s, historically, women have left the labour market to care for families and some never return. Now when you're working with survey data that means you'll have missing earnings information for that group. And if the characteristics of those who have left the labour market defer to those who have remained in, all of a sudden your sample won't be representative and the estimate of the premium may well be biased. In our case because we're looking at age 25-26 this is less of an issue so it's not one of the challenges we faced in our research. Obviously, in the case of cohort studies and the LFS, data is self-reported, so people might question how accurately this is provided. 
In the case of earnings, what we do is we compare our earnings data to data from the annual survey of hours and earnings because it's collected by employers and therefore more likely to be accurate. And the cohort study data seems to be reasonable. In the case of qualifications, previous work by Lorraine Dearden actually shows that the shorter the time between you completing your qualification and being surveyed, the less likely you are to misreport. So again, because we're looking at age 25, 26, that's less likely to be an issue here. Some people might question why we've included job tenure and health status as controls, given that education might actually impact your health status, for example. Actually, the literature in the UK suggests that education doesn't impact self-reported health status, but we do remove these controls and rerun our estimates to see if there's any change in the results, and there isn't. In the case of the British cohort study, we only have data on net pay and not gross pay as would have been ideal, so what we do is we uh, essentially calculate gross pay from 1996 tax data, we rerun our estimates and again there's no material change in the findings. Now coming on to the labour force survey. So as I said earlier there were two main reasons we utilise the LS LFS here but our first uh, port of call was to create a data set that covered 25 years as shown on the slides and we restrict our sample to the same age group as we used for the cohort studies. And essentially, the uh, definitions remain the same. So with the LFS, we begin by building birth cohorts born around 1970 and 1990, because we don't have detailed controls in the LFS. We're just estimating the premium uh, without any controls. And then we conduct equivalent analysis in the cohort studies and then compare them. Um, and we do this separately by sex. So here are the results for the cohort studies in the LFS for males, and you can see that the results are qualitatively and quantitatively similar across these two data sets. Essentially, they're suggesting a decline of five to six percentage points over those two decades. In the case of females, what we see is that, again, qualitatively, the results are very similar, a decline uh, over the two decade period. The anomaly there being that very high premium we see in the 1970 birth cohort within the LFS. And we did some further digging into well, what's causing this uh, particularly high figure. And what we found in our sample for the 1996 LFS year was that female graduates were actually reporting higher wages than male graduates, which runs that counter to the standard evidence on the gender wage gap. Actually, you might think, well, could that be driven by small sample sizes? So we extended the number of LFS years to 95 to 99. And even then, there was very little disparity between the pay of males and female graduates. So that atypical pattern we saw in the LFS in those early years made us think, well, this, those results should be regarded as more tentative. And then coming to the issue around timings of uh, changes, what we did with that 25-year data set is we said, let's build five-year birth cohorts, as shown in the slide, estimate the premium for each, and see how the premium has changed over time. So for males, what you see is that there's essentially a period of stability, and then you start to see more uh, of a decline, particularly for the most recent birth cohort, born around late 1980s and early 1990s. And perhaps this recent drop is one of the reasons why previous literature has not picked up a fall. In the case of females, you see a fall and then some stability, and then a further fall in the most recent cohort. For reasons described earlier, we have to regard these results as a bit more tentative. And that's just a summary of the key findings. But in terms of the concluding thoughts on this, so we, I presented the model of Blundell earlier. <coughs> On the basis of our evidence, we could not reject their model. It may well be that their model is correct. But there are other factors at play that we should recognize. And so, for example, you saw a decline for the most recent birth cohorts for males and females. That birth cohort would have been entering the labor market around the time of the Great Recession. And it could be that the Great Recession has had a particular impact on young graduate workers. Actually, in our full academic paper, we extend the age range to those aged uh, 25 to essentially 59. And we find amongst males that the decline after 2007 is evident amongst those aged 25 to 34. But there's no such decline amongst older age groups. 2007 also represents the kind of time when we started to see a rise in the proportion of uh, graduates being awarded a first. 
Now, if that's led to employers changing their perceptions on the value of a degree, that might have also contributed to the decline. And then finally, bringing in the ASH data again, if you look at the ASH data from 2014 to 2019, there's been slower pay growth in professional occupations, which are typically occupied by graduates, compared to uh, element elementary occupations, which are generally occupied by non-graduates. And that's shown in this final slide here, which I've taken directly from the ONS. So in terms of further research, well, we can't reject the model by Blundell, but we should recognize that our findings are looking at a short-term decline. We need to carry on doing this research to see if it's part of a long-term phenomenon and also to better understand the reasons why we're starting to see this fall. Um, that's basically the end of my presentation, but I just want to say these are some links to our, the paper itself and our research. We've also done, created a new UK-wide measure of deprivation, and given its discussion today, I thought that might be useful, as well as a new measure on job quality relating to the Taylor review of modern working practices. If there's any questions I can't answer now, if it, feel free to email me and I'll get back to you, but that concludes my discussion.